The purpose of this episode is to explore common health and well-being strengths and challenges for people with Down syndrome. The content discussed here is not meant as a substitution for direct medical care with relevant professionals. Rather, we hope to share new and little known information so that families and supporters can be well informed when accessing medical care. Your child or student's medical or educational professionals may have recommended different practices or procedures that are specific to your child or student. Do not modify or change your child's treatment or therapy plan without consulting with your care provider first. Today on the Lowdown, a Down Syndrome podcast, Dr. Raphael Pelayo gives us a lowdown on sleeping issues for people with Down Syndrome. Over to you, Marla Hanna. Thanks, Danielle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lowdown podcast. My name is Hannah Mahmoud, and I am the Senior Occupational Therapist at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation. And I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Marla Folden, who is an SLP at the DSRF. Hi, Marla. Hi, Hannah. How are you? Doing pretty well today. Are you? Good. I'm good. I'm very, very excited about our we guest do. today. Me too. Um, yeah. So today's, we're very excited about today's episode because we will be discussing a topic that uh, comes up in almost every conversation we have with our parents and caregivers of individuals with Down syndrome, which is sleep. Huge, huge, huge issue. Um, children with Down syndrome sleep poorly with more fragmented sleep and frequent awakenings compared to typically developing kids. And, you know, for many of us, a poor night's sleep can moderately impact our functioning throughout the day. But for our clients with Down syndrome who experience prolonged sleep difficulties, the impact is far more severe, including challenges of behavior, poor emotional regulation, impaired attention, and an adverse impact of their overall physical health. So today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Rafael Paleo to the Lowdown podcast. And Thank you. Welcome. We're glad to have you today. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about you so that our listeners get to know sort of your background and where you're coming from. So Dr. Rafael Paleo is a clinical professor at Stanford University School of Medicine in the Division of Sleep Medicine, which I think is Department of Psychiatry, if I'm not wrong. He graduated with a degree in biology from the University of Puerto Rico. He, his initial exposure to sleep medicine was as a med student in the Albert Einstein School of Medicine, and that experience led him to pursue a career in sleep medicine. As a pathway into sleep medicine, he trained as a child neurologist. Oh, he's just the best person for us to interview. It's so yeah. great. <laughs> um, and he joined the Stanford Sleep Disorders Clinic in 1993 and never left. Um, the focus of Dr. Palayo's treatment of sleep disorders has been in patients of all ages, and he chairs the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's Political Action Committee. In 2019, he was appointed to serve on the board of the National Sleep Foundation in the States, and he also serves as on the board of the START School. And he has served as the chair of the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board on the National Center for Sleep Disorders Research at the National Heart Lung Blood Institute at the NIH. That's a lot of things. <laughs> and he also chaired the Pediatric Special Interest Sleep Section of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So was welcome. That was, that, that, was, that was in the past. I don't do that anymore. Okay. Because the, the <laughs> they dissolved that. Um, okay. And I have, a book, I have a book coming out. Oh, fantastic. What's, yeah, what's you can, the title you can of the look book? it up. How to Sleep. It's very straightforward. Yeah. yeah so if Excellent. you look up How to Sleep, the uh, publisher is a company called, a New York City publisher named Workman. Okay. Uh, it'll be out in the, in the late fall, probably be in Great. stores in December. Great. So, how, yeah, so it's already, the cover and all that's already done. It's called How to Sleep. Okay, awesome. and we will look for that. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Pelayo, usually when we interview somebody here, mm-hmm. we start with five secret questions. It's not a test. It's just for people mm-hmm. to get to know you better. So <laughs> do you mind if we start with that? Depends. I don't have to answer. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So the first question is, what are you currently listening to? Could be a podcast or an audio book or some kind of music that you're enjoying a lot. Uh, last night, I was listening to a CD of the band R.E.M. Oh, oh. wow. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 
Yeah. I was actually very lucky to see them in concert before they broke up. So they're great. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw them when they came, they did an outdoor concert in Burnaby. It was awesome. Oh yeah. The summer series. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And the second question would be, what would be your favorite season and why? The fall. Mm. I love the fall. It's just kind of a nice transition. It happens to be around time of my birthday. But I just have always liked the time of the year. I like the, the transition of seasons. I like yeah. the Indian summers when we get them. And I like the, the cool nights also, sitting by mm -hmm. the fire. So I love mm -hmm. the fall. Love it. Love it. Um, okay. I'm going to take over for a bit. If you could meet any historical figure, um, alive or dead, who would it be? And I know this is a bit of a tough question to give you right off the bat, but... <laughs> I thought of this, but I don't want to tell you who I thought. Uh, when I was in college, I got in trouble for saying Hugh Hefner. Oh. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's the... So I always remember that, that, that issue. Um, yeah. I would love to meet Obama. I'd like to talk to mm -hmm. President Obama if I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good one. Um, okay, question number four. What is your ideal way to spend a weekend? Right now with the uh, social distancing, I've started going to some like just drives around uh, Northern California is beautiful. So mm -hmm. I've just been staying in my car, driving, listening to music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with my wife or one of my children, I really like doing that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And the, you, the eucalyptus in Northern California is just so spectacular. I would just drive and go see all of those. <laughs> we have those. We also have the big redwoods too. Yes. You got, you got plenty of trees in Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> we do. We don't smell like eucalyptus. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But I, that's what I've been doing lately. I've, I've, I've discovered a bunch of like back roads that I've never been on mm. because I'm not trying to get anywhere. I'm just seeing yeah. what happens if I go down this road. Yeah. And I just start driving until the road ends. And then I find another road. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing lately. That. Nice. I love yeah. that. That's really great. Okay. And our last question. So Marla had mentioned that you did your undergraduate degree in Puerto Rico. For anyone traveling to Puerto Rico, hopefully post COVID, when everything can kind of go back to normal, what would you uh, recommend? they do like what would be the first thing that they should check out or do in Puerto Rico I, th I think if you arrive in Puerto Rico for the first time you're going to be there for a few days mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do is just go to the beach and do nothing but stay at the beach mm -hmm. just let it soak in yeah just just get a sense of the island by being around the beach being around local people later you can go do some sightseeing and things like that but I would just mm -hmm. go to the beach land land that sand maybe go to the beaches on the far eastern side Mm -hmm. The island are really nice. Even off the coast of the mainland of Port the main island of Puerto Rico, there's some beautiful beaches, Vieques and Culebra. Yeah. Which the sand is like sugar, clear water. Oh wow. Just just go oh, there yeah. and do do go there and do nothing. <laughs> just go in that beach and do nothing. Yeah. Things will food and drinks will come to you. Just play <laughs> in that beach. Do that for a few days first and then explore the rest of the island. Love it. I'm not even a beach person, but you've sold me now. <laughs> I kind of want to check it out now. I'm not a beach vacation person, but I want to do it now. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was really great. I appreciate you kind of playing along with that with us. And I think our listeners kind of got a good sense of, um, of what you like and not. So let's kind of dive into what we're here to talk about. Um, as Marla was reading your biography, I noticed that your expertise fall into a few areas. So psychiatry, sleep medicine, child neurology, and behavioral science. How do all of these domains work together in your everyday interactions with your patients? One of the things I like about sleep medicine, if you look at the symbol for sleep medicine, the, is actually the yin and yang, the black and white symbol. And that was meant to be represent the day and the night, but I've taken it to mean that in sleep medicine, we don't separate the mind from the brain. It goes mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And the work that I do works with that together. We don't need to separate the mind from the brain. So even though I train as a child neurologist, I mostly take care of adults in the form of psychiatry. And I like that because I get to work with all ages. And I've come to think about sleep, not as how an individual sleeps, but I like to think about how a family sleeps. Mm -hmm. oh. It's very important we think about how, how Down syndrome works because mm -hmm. some things we can't change and some things we can, but if I can help that child's mother sleep better, that'll mm -hmm. help her work with that child cool. more. Mm -hmm. So I really like to think about the entire family mm -hmm. and how they're sleeping. And, that, and so I like the integrating of the mind and the brain. And that's what I try to do in my work. Mm -hmm. A very holistic approach for sure. Yeah, right. but, but it has to be that way because we yeah. can't separate the mind from the brain. If you've had poor sleep for more than two or three months, it, it may be a physical reason. A child with Down syndrome could have a large tongue and block their breathing. But once you've had poor sleep for more than two or three months, it will never be an entirely physical problem mm -hmm. because sleeping is something that we learn how to do. Sleeping is a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, we're taught how to sleep. Mm 
-hmm. All babies will drink milk at birth. But what a five-year-old eats throughout the planet will be different. And when you visit other countries, the first thing you want to look at is what, what, what are the foods there? Mm -hmm. So the need to eat is biological, but what you eat is cultural. Sleep is the same way. The need for sleep is biological, but the way you sleep is learned. And we teach our kids how to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I like to get into, how the, entire, how the entire family sleeps. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Makes it very and clear. Yeah, that's great. And, I, and I, uh, I'm so happy that you kind of touched on this because my next question was asking you about um, in a previous presentation of yours that I heard you had referred to sleep as a learned behavior and that we're often taught this behavior incorrectly. So could you expand on that a little bit more? I mean, maybe especially as it may relate to individuals with developmental disabilities or gout syndrome? Sure. I mean, I think it was, it's kind of, you've been sleeping longer than you've been doing pretty much any other activity. Mm -hmm. You've been sleeping longer than you've been eating food or breathing oxygen because you sleep in the womb. You sleep in utero. Before you have your first breath of air or you have your first taste of food, you've already been sleeping. Mm -hmm. So considering the fact that we've been sleeping for so long and a third of our life sleeping, we don't spend a third of our life eating, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, it's amazing to think that you would have to learn how to sleep. But yeah. you have to learn how to sleep because there's an inherent paradox of sleeping. Sleep, sleeping animals can be attacked at any point. Mm -hmm. So all animals seem to have defense mechanisms that occur while they're sleeping. And humans are no exception. We're very successful animals. But there are a lot of misconceptions about sleep. Mm -hmm. In fact, the sleep, sleep for a long, long time, for hundreds and hundreds of years, was thought to be a death-like state. Mm -hmm. and, that, and you hear it on the way people talk. People say things, and you may have heard people say this, I'm sure, saying, well, I can't sleep because I can't turn off my brain. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's crazy. You're not supposed to turn off your brain. Your yeah. brain is active. In fact, your brain is protecting you while you're sleeping. And some parts of our brain are more active while we're sleeping than when we're awake. Mm -hmm. For you to hear my voice, I, basically the sound waves are banging off your ear, the eardrums and being represented. For If you were to have a dream, of, of, of somebody saying something to you, you have to create that image. It requires more energy to mm -hmm. dream about something than to just see it in real life, get it physically. So some parts of the brain are more uh, metabolically active when we're sleeping than when we're awake. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, your peak heart rate is when you're dreaming. Wow. So, so sleep is an active state. That's one of the main discoveries of the 1950s. And early on, it's carried forward that sleep is not a passive state, but people still think of it that way. Yeah, And they also equate sleeping with being tired, which is another common mistake. Being tired and being sleepy may converge or may diverge. Anybody who's been jet lagged knows there's a difference between being sleepy and being tired. And if the listeners were to get up now and do 100 jumping jacks, mm -hmm. you might feel tired, not going to be sleepy. Mm -hmm. so this idea of needing to be tired to sleep or turning off your brain, these are misconceptions. And people are trapped in these misconceptions. Mm -hmm. That's what drives the sleep problems. When people have sleep issues, they talk a certain way. Nobody else really talks the way they do. And it'll catch your ear if you pay attention to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. For example, people with sleep problems say things like, I try to sleep. I try to go to sleep. Nobody else says that. Everybody else says, I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to get hungry. You're not trying to breathe. So once somebody's trying to do this, okay, now you know something is wrong. And then when you talk about children or adults, um, you got to get a sense of, what, of what's the motivation of that person to go to sleep. I think of sleep in four dimensions. Whenever I talk to anybody about their sleep, I, I break it down to four dimensions. I think about the amount of sleep, the amount of sleep, the quality of their sleep, mm -hmm. the timing of their sleep, and their state mm -hmm. of mind. Mm -hmm. You got to get a sense from the individual when they talk about bedtimes, who's picked this bedtime? Is it convenient for the parents or for the child? Who, what, and also it's not just falling asleep, it's waking up, right? Do you sleep to live or live to sleep? It's a different thing, mm -hmm. right? So, so we got to think about what is your incentive to get out of bed? Waking up is biological. Getting out of bed is volitional. What if that person has no desire to get out of bed? Or it doesn't matter to them if yeah. they get out of bed, right? What are, you, yeah. what are you getting up for? Are you looking forward to tomorrow or dreading tomorrow? So I, I really think of sleep in that, that entire context when I think about how one individual sleeps. And I want to think about the entire families and, and all the four domains, how the families interact with each other in this arena also. Mm -hmm. did, did I answer your question? I just went off and talked about random no, stuff. No, no. <laughs> you, yeah. you answered our question, but you gave us so much more to think about because I think we have to really understand the, what sleep is and the function of sleep and how, um, what our conceptions are about sleep in order to really help figure out how to solve the problems that we are having with sleep. So I think that was super helpful. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts, Marla? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm going to 
focus us in a little bit on Down syndrome here, because as yeah. I'm sure you know, 50 to 90% of kids with Down syndrome have obstructive sleep apnea. I, from, from my perspective, that margin is super wide. And I think it speaks to the inconsistent testing and the changes that they go through as they grow older. Um, certainly the dually diagnosed group of kids with Down syndrome and autism have more impaired sleeping. And in our clinic, Hina and I both have about 50% of our students that have a dual diagnosis. So we see that a lot and those families are extremely stressed out. Mm -hmm. um, can, and some of our students actually also have a central sleep apnea diagnosis. So there's, there's a lot of things in the mix. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the types of sleep apnea for our listeners to make that piece of it really clear? Sure. The term apnea means without air. Mm -hmm. And the, so sleep apnea is somebody who is not breathing while they're asleep. And I, I want you to just take a moment and think about how important sleeping is. Mm -hmm. That the brain decides, the brain's hierarchical decision, the way the brain is designed, created, evolved, everyone think of it, that it, sh it decides I'd rather sleep than breathe. Mm -hmm. That's how important sleeping is. So the brain continues to sleep despite the person stopping breathing. Eventually you have to breathe and your sleep will be interrupted in order for you to breathe. Mm -hmm. But for a window of time, the brain says, I prefer to sleep than to breathe. So, uh, and the term is obstructive sleep apnea means that there's a blockage of your breathing, an obstruction, a blockage. And then as you mentioned, the central sleep apnea where the brain is not sending a signal to the diaphragm to inflate the lungs. Mm -hmm. There are, you can have both. You can have mixed conditions. You can have obstructive and central apnea. By far, in Down syndrome, it's going to be obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. The American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, my understanding is that all children with Down syndrome by the age of four should be tested for sleep apnea mm -hmm. because the condition is so prevalent. And a lot of them aren't getting tested. I'm sure it may not be available. There may be other issues with it. Mm -hmm. Having uh, Now, something to be aware of is that central sleep apnea on a sleep study may actually be obstructive and it may be a wrong diagnosis on some of the some of the kids. Central sleep apnea is silent. Mm -hmm. Obstructive is, is snores. So if I see somebody who snores as obstructive and maybe central sleep apnea, the central apnea may actually be an artifact of the recording technique because when we measure it, we put these bands around their chest and the abdomen, and we have a microphone for snoring and an airflow signal, usually on the upper lip. And what can occur is that if the if the airflow signal on the upper lip is flat or diminished, we say that's an apnea. Mm -hmm. Then we look down at the chest and say, well, is the chest moving up and down? That means you're trying to breathe and the air is not coming out. That's called obstructive. And if no effort is being made uh, to breathe, then we say it's central. And that's a very simple way of thinking about this. But what happens sometimes is because these are all night recordings. These are multiple hours, nine, mm -hmm. 10 hour recordings, and the bands can slide or slip and, and we lose the signal. Mm -hmm. okay. So when the technologist is acquiring the data, they have to decide, do I go in and fix these belts? Wake the kid up. And, yeah. and, and, wake, and, and risk mm -hmm. waking up the kid who may not want to go back to sleep later, or do I keep collecting data? So what can happen is, if something is obstructive, it really is obstructive. If something is central, it might be central, it might be obstructive, and it just looks that way, mm -hmm. briefly. So sometimes what we do, depending on the clinical situation, especially if the child snores, is treat the central sleep apnea as if it's obstructive first and see okay. if the central then goes away. Okay. Other, to, now things get even more complicated because sometimes the kid only has obstructive sleep apnea when they diagnose a sleep apnea, but then if they use one of these breathing machines called the CPAP machine, which we can talk about I'm sure in more detail later, continuous oh, yeah. positive mm -hmm. airway pressure, CPAP, when you, when you blow the air down a child's throat, or an adult also, sometimes you stretch out the throat and the brain's reaction is to stop breathing because things are getting too much air. Yeah. So sometimes the central apnea is an artifact of the treatment that we're offering the child or the adult. They call that complex sleep apnea sometimes. So the, the central sleep apnea that we're seeing in the kids may really be central, could be, mm -hmm. but it could also be an artifact of the recording technique or, an, or, or iatrogenic being induced by the treatment that we give in the person. Okay. So you always keep that in mind a little bit when we see uh, these people. Then the main thing is obstructive sleep apnea will snore and central sleep apnea typically doesn't. Okay. And those are really good things to know. I think we have a lot of families that come to us that insist that their child sleeps well. And we know from research that parents are actually not a good and valid reporting measure on their child's sleep quality. Um, but certainly, I think the children that are diagnosed with central sleep apnea also tend to have a dual diagnosis. Am I right, Hannah? 
if you think of your people. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. if I think anecdotally, yes. So for they sure. have a lot going mm -hmm. on. Well, they may also have something, uh, they may have a third diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You can get central sleep apnea, let's say you have a, um, an Arnold Chiari malformation of the cerebellum where okay. it's yeah. coming down, you can get yeah. one of those. Some of the medications that people are given to help them sleep better if they're sedating can induce central sleep apnea. Right. Um, hmm. You can get central sleep apnea for, um, can generally, you, what I tell my patients is you can break your right arm and your left leg. There's no reason to only look for one diagnosis for these things. Sometimes if something's complicated, we're trying to pigeonhole them into a single yeah. um, mm -hmm. diagnosis when there's actually more than one thing going on. So you can have central apnea. It, has, it should be, it should, if it doesn't go away, it should be explored. It should not be accepted as just bad luck. Yeah. Um, an unrelated condition, but some parents would know this is Prader-Willi syndrome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Prader-Willi can have both obstructive and central apnea as part of the syndrome in of itself. Okay. That's mm -hmm. good to know. So I guess for our parents listening, then we would recommend pursuing it a little bit further. Certainly. I would first I would first not freak out if they say your kid has central sleep apnea, that, yeah, um, that tends to because 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 that because that tends to be incurable, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's likely obstructive. Okay. So I would take obstructive sleep apnea seriously, and central I would just put, hey, maybe it is obstructive, and it just appears that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let's treat it as obstructive first and then see what we get. Mm -hmm. um, if obstructive sleep apnea is corrected or not present at all, then definitely in the sleep, the central sleep apnea remains. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a first night effect. By the way, the other reason we get central events, I should have mentioned, is the control of breathing is different awake than asleep. When you're awake, you can hold your breath, you can sing, you can laugh, you can sing, you, you, you can sing, right? So the control of breathing is different awake than asleep. And when we, we transition from the awake world to the, to the sleep world, and when we do that transition, sometimes we have a central apnea, which is thought to be completely normal. Okay. And, and so, so some of these central events, if they're very short and self-limited self events, they just may be physiological transitions. So you have a child sleeping in a room that he's never slept in before, wires on the head, they're uncomfortable, they may be a little scared or freaked out. They may have very choppy sleep. And those central events are actually just, again, an artifact of being in an in unfamiliar environment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yes, central apnea is real. I don't, I'm not trying to downplay it if, if it's really there, but more likely than not, it's obstructive with the central not being maybe an art, art, artifactual finding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's mm -hmm. excellent information. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to talk about two more sleep conditions that affect our population regularly. Um, the first of these is restless leg syndrome. Can you talk a little bit about that? Restless leg syndrome is, is described as being, uh, used to be described as the most common disorder you'd never heard of. Mm -hmm. oh. And first, um, and people would have it and thought it wasn't real. The um, first described over 600 years ago, and it, it was given a name by, um, sir, I forgot his first name, but the last name is Willis. Sir something Willis, I apologize not remembering his first name, but Willis is important. Uh, name to know because it said our brains we have a traffic circle of arteries mm -hmm. of blood circle called the circle of, of the circle, circle of Willis. Of Willis. Yeah. 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 Same guy. Okay. You guys know it. He's Same busy. guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was observing, right? Yeah. He was yeah. observing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the same guy who coined, who who found the circle of Willis, or named after him, also was the first person to describe restless legs as a medical condition. Before then, people thought it was a curse because it, it sounds like a curse over 600 years ago, you can imagine how this would be viewed as a mm -hmm. curse mm -hmm. because it's the perfect kind of curse to have. When you talk to people with restless legs, you'll often say it feels like a curse because it's a condition that doesn't bother you when you're working and going about walking around. But when yeah. you want to want to get your rest, then it comes up. It, it's, it's a diabolic condition to mm -hmm. have, if you think of it, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's fine as long as you keep walking. And the newsletter for the Restless Leg Foundation was, and I think it still is, it's called the, the Night Walkers, to get up and walk. Now, uh, I must say, I did not know that restless legs had a higher prevalence than average in Down's population until you mentioned it just now. I'm, I will talk to you more about it. Um, not sure why, but I, I, I have a suspicion why it may be happening. Um, but I'm just speculating now, hearing it from you for the first time. A restless leg is a very common condition. It runs in families, strongly runs in families. Um, in fact, it's unusual to have somebody, only one person who has it in the family. And the youngest person I had was a little girl that came from China. She was two or three years old and she didn't speak English, but we couldn't figure out why well, she wasn't sleeping well. And um, 
the parents would try to, the adoptive parents try to sleep with her and she would just sleep even worse. If somebody has a sleep issue and you think it's behavioral, if you let them sleep with you, they tend to get better. And mm -hmm. if you sleep with them and they're still sleeping poorly, it's more likely to be physical. And of course, it can be a combination. So this little girl was sleeping horribly and we couldn't figure out why and we couldn't understand what was happening. And I said, maybe she's low, uh, low in iron because um, restless legs is a condition related to iron metabolism. Mm -hmm. She could have been malnourished and sure enough, she was low in iron. We gave her some nice supplementation. She slept better. When she learned to speak English, more clearly one of the first words she ever said was itchy to describe oh. the feelings in her legs. Yeah. Um, so restless legs is described as an unpleasant feeling that's hard to describe. Um, just this uncomfortable feeling in the legs. It's not necessarily painful, but it's unpleasant. Children may often describe it as growing pains. Their parents describe it as growing pains. But in fact, it's not supposed to hurt us to grow. Mm -hmm. So, but you'll see parents, oh, I had growing pains. My kid has growing pains. It runs in our family. It's probably restless legs. But there's a wide variation in how it shows up. And some people have it so mild, they don't even really notice it unless they're low on iron. So women, when they go through pregnancy, people who donate blood on a regular basis, adults with uh, occult cancers, like a colon cancer, may have a flare-up of restless legs. And so the, the restless legs act like a canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Anybody with a genetic tendency towards restless legs, if they're low in iron, it'll show up more. Yeah, so it's, possi it's possible. So I'm not, I'm not sure if Downs by itself makes you more, pre more prone to have restless legs symptoms versus having the actual condition yeah maybe a little bit there may be a distinction there going on there yeah and um, i think it's uh the reason why we kind of wanted to talk to you about the restless leg part was because it's always something that doctors look into first when there's sleep difficulties with our with our population and majority of them are very low in iron so it's <laughs> always like that first step to figuring out a sleep issue like okay let's check the iron first let's see if that's what's causing you know the and that's Marlo the easiest fix and that's really. the easiest thing to look at and the easiest yeah. fix for so that's kind of where we were coming from with that as well was just mm -hmm. trying to understand and i think with our population too it's hard for them to communicate what that would feel like and if that is a cause of you know and we're gonna marlo's gonna talk to you about this in a second but their frequent nighttime awakenings it's a huge problem with our population so mm -hmm. so that's kind of what we were thinking of the rest of the will flare up also when they do something that's boring to them so it may go away after watching a video game that they like or playing mm -hmm. a video game. But if you have to go on the drive that they're bored or go some, visit somebody, then they'll really have a hard time sitting still yeah. and be uncomfortable when they have that. Yeah. Um, okay. And sometimes all you need is to give them some structured activities at night. Let's go for a walk. Um, let's say you have a family dog. Let's, mm -hmm. let's walk the dog in the evening. Mm -hmm. Strenuous exercise can make it worse at night. So a, a, yeah, an exercise, aerobics class or something at night or... So something like that may not be the right move, but yeah. uh, something that's a mild or moderate exercise, they may like give us a little chance to get that energy out of their legs. And also you want to know it before they get on any airplanes, assuming we can travel again someday. Yeah. You want to give them a little chance to get some energy out before, before they get on the plane. Absolutely, yeah. You, and sometimes sometimes yeah. we'll give, use medication just as a spot check. The dopamine type medications you can give them just before they, like an hour before they get on the plane or something yeah. to calm their legs down. So things you yeah. can do. Yeah. Low doses is what work. If you give them too high a dose, it makes it worse. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're not sure if it's restless legs or not and you give them the medication and the parents say, oh, he's worse now. Well, that's actually good news. That mm -hmm. means that if you come across a diagnosis now because you made it worse, now you got to yeah. find the right medication for them. Yeah. But, but inadvertently making it worse temporarily can be a therapeutic uh, that, um can be, excuse me, a diagnostic signal that, that you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the last sort of sleep issue that I wanted to start with in this intro section is insomnias or frequent nighttime wakings. And with your four domains of spe uh, speech, ha, speech, <laughs> sleep, <laughs> sleep um, could you speak about how insomnia or frequent night wakings fits in with that? Because it's probably all four areas. I'm sure. Sorry. And I think you said insomnia with an S. I think you said it in plural. Did you mm -hmm. say it that way, Marla? I did. Yeah. I'm glad. Most people don't say it that way. Yeah. But, but I think that's the right way of saying it. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're different. They're different ver there are a lot of variations on, insom on, on types of insomnia. Insomnia mm -hmm. is a symptom that can become a syndrome. Insomnia is a complaint of, un of poor quality sleep, either trouble falling asleep or trouble staying asleep, to the point that bothers you the next day. If there's no daytime impairment, then there's no insomnia. So if you're up all night and seem to enjoy it and it doesn't bother you, there's no insomnia. Now with a child, it may be different because the child may stay up all night and like it mm. and the parents are complaining. Mm. So sometimes you got to say, where is the subjective issue? Mm 
mm -hmm. uh, for them. So insomnia is this complaint of trouble, falling asleep or staying asleep, point is next time, daytime impairment, and that's a symptom. But when it goes on for more than three months, it takes on a life of its own and becomes a syndrome. Just like you can have pain symptoms and pain syndromes. Yep. So we can correct somebody's insomnia syndrome. Doesn't mean they're not gonna get insomnia again someday because at some point in our lives, we're just gonna lose sleep. I, I, for example, have trouble sleeping if I have to catch an early morning flight and I'm staying at a hotel, I don't wanna miss my flight. And I tend to wake up before the alarm clock but I don't typically set an alarm clock. So we can have situational insomnia. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that you never have insomnia again because insomnia is actually a defense mechanism. It's a way of the brain, brain protecting itself. Sometimes we have to avoid sleeping. How can a mother um, have a baby that uh, sleeps eight hours if the baby has to eat every two to four hours? Mm -hmm. That There has to be a biological mechanism to interrupt your sleep, take care yeah. of something and go back to sleep. So waking up at night is biologically uh, hardwired into our brains and all humans wake up about every hour and a half. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main uh, early discoveries of sleep in the 50s was that nobody really sleeps eight hours in a row. The issue is not whether your child wakes up at night. The real issue is because your child is falling back asleep on their own or they need your help to do this. If the child learns to fall asleep a certain way, let's say being rocked or told stories or the lights on, if you fall asleep with the lights on, the TV on or some, some music on, and then when you find yourself an hour or two hours later and the lights are off, everything's dark, you should be surprised. Just like if you fall asleep in your bedroom and an hour and a half later you're in the kitchen, you should be alarmed. How'd you get there? So the thing for, I really focus on is not the waking up. Mm -hmm. It's why you have trouble going back to sleep. Yeah. So insomnia, we can think of sleep onset insomnia in little kids as something that they learn to do. And they, the term that's used is sleep, on, sleep onset association disorder. Child that learns to sleep a certain way, being rocked, held, whatever like that. And then we have the situation of trouble staying asleep. So your adults will tell you they have trouble staying asleep. Your kids will tell you they have trouble falling asleep. But if you really question your adults who say they have trouble only staying asleep, if you ask them how do they fall asleep, you'll see that they have trouble falling asleep that they're masking. So, so they're doing things to the last way. second. Okay. Yeah, uh, and we can talk about rituals and uh, why they're important in a moment because there's something there's some things to point out about that. But they'll have something that they do. They may read until the the, the book falls out of their hand and their partner turns off the lights for them, or they, they do something else. But it's usually trouble both falling asleep first and then later trouble staying asleep. Some some people later in life, like women, some of the moms and, and the uh, listening in. And women have more insomnia than men. Men, of course, have insomnia too. But statistically, it's more common in women, particularly more common in women after menopause. And you'll have some older moms who will have trouble staying asleep. And it's, it's uh, frequently uh, part of the, 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 the transition as they're going through menopause. It changes hormones. Progesterone is, is a hormone that helps people sleep. And when those numbers start getting down, people have trouble staying asleep. Um, uh, I was going to make a point about the, uh, about the kids. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you'll see a lot, if, if you accept the idea that sleep is a learned behavior, something you taught how to do, a lot of the kids will, will talk about being scared of the dark, and but they, but they won't admit it because they're not supposed to say that. Kids with Downs are, are not as guarded sometimes, which are the nice things about talking with them. They, they're just more honest when you speak with mm -hmm. them. Um, but uh, it's kids in general, they, 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 they talk about things. Well, some people, when they have trouble sleeping, there's a degree of shame. A lot of people with sleep problems kind of blame themselves for their sleep problems and don't mask it. So somebody, parents will say things, well, um, he's falling asleep okay. But when you talk with them, they, they, if you get into the details, we try to be a fly on the wall. Some of the things they'll describe to you is like leaving a night, uh, a night light on or leaving the, the, the bedroom door slightly open and the mm -hmm. light in the hallway on or the bathroom light on. I say, well, what's that for? What's that light for? Well, he likes it that way or she likes it that way. What is it that, what is it that they want about this? Mm -hmm. Why is that important to them? Why do they want this light for? And I think what happens is that children are taught that they usually start sleeping with their parents or parents are near them to get tucked in. And then at night, they're not there. And then they get scared, like, well, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And the light, the darkness represents them being left alone. And they learn to associate darkness with being left alone. So they want the light on to check things out. But the light is not really um, necessary. They don't need it. Uh, I saw a 15-year-old girl one time who had, was in the habit of walking to the parents' room a lot. And a lot of the, the your parents say, Mike, these kids walk into their rooms. 
And it's actually kind of a rude thing. If you know, if you talk with them, you see that they always go to only one of the parents. They don't go to both parents. Mm -hmm. They know which parent to go to. They know which yes. side of the bed to go to. And if you ask the child or they ask the parent, how come it doesn't go to the other person? It says, well, that other person won't, won't do anything. So it falls on the parent to do that, to the one, the parent that's been uh, designated to do this. Um, so this 15-year-old kept coming to the, into the, uh, the room. What happened was she was raised single mom. Um, they used to share the same bed. And then when she was, when the mother remarried, they had the child sleep separately from them. And she kept coming into the room at night. And when we talk about her routine, she always left the light on in the hallway on. I think the bathroom light on. And I asked her, what's going on? And she finally said, I'm scared of monsters. And I told her, if I was a monster, is it easy to find your lights are on, lights are off? It's easy to find you if lights are on. And what we try to do with, with the children, the adults and the children, especially the children, is you can be creative because they have magical thinking. Mm -hmm. So you want to reframe things for them. And the concept of cognitive behavioral therapy is to realize, to think about things differently. So you want to tell them that darkness is how you're safe. You don't fear the dark. Dark is good news. Mm -hmm. You're safer in the dark. Mm -hmm. We like the dark. The brain likes being in the dark. We don't like sleeping with the lights on. It's not good. Plus, oh, you can frame it that you're wasting energy and things like that also. So there's other ways of teaching them this, but you can do this. The reason you mentioned, I think, Marla, you mentioned the word rituals. Um, mm -hmm. And people often say, well, hey, we need routines, but routines is not really the issue because you can have routines that are unpleasant. I had a child I took care of whose father was a stickler about how his kid would have to brush his teeth. So that was like a thing. So as mm -hmm. in that approach, the tension built in the household, because oh he's going to have his uh, tooth brushing inspection going on, have his teeth inspected. So there's a routine to brush his teeth, but it wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. The reason we want, one of the, the misconceptions that people have about sleep is that we fall asleep when we're bored. And boredom does not make people sleepy. That's a misconception. What happens is when you are bored, it means you're safe. To the brain, the most dangerous thing we can do is sleeping. If you're in a boring situation, if you're in a monotonous situation, it must mean you're safe. When you're in danger, you don't feel bored. Mm -hmm. So if most people are sleep deprived, end of the day, you are sleep deprived. The, bi the biological drive to sleep is building. By providing you with a monotonous, predictable environment that's pleasant, what you're doing is signaling to the brain you're in a safe environment. So the monotony, the routine, equates with safety. When a little kid gets a full night's sleep in the morning and they're bored, they don't go take a nap. They misbehave. They look for something to do, right? Teenagers fall asleep at their desks when they're bored in school, not because they're bored. They fall asleep because they're sleep deprived. And boredom means I can catch my sleep now. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want the routines to be, is that we're all about conducing this environment of feeling safe, in a state of serenity and predictable. That's what that's about. It's not about the routine per se, it's what the environment that the, that the routine creates, predictability. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a predictable environment and you're sleep deprived, that, that wonderful sleepy feeling will come on, right? That yeah. the sense of it, it's okay, it's coming. Mm -hmm. right? You don't have to force somebody to sleep. Sleep, you leave it alone, it's gonna come. Just like breathing. When it says, I wanna hold my breath, go ahead. You'll start breathing eventually. Mm -hmm. Sleep will always come. You can't stop somebody from sleeping. What you want to do is get them in a, in a situation where they find sleeping something they look forward to. You get yeah. to go to sleep. You got to stop saying you have to go to sleep. It's you get to go to sleep. It's a great mm -hmm. privilege to have a safe, comfortable place to sleep. Not everybody has that. And we're providing that to these kids, I hope. Yeah, that, that's kind of that connection to earlier what you were saying about how sleep is a learned behavior. Like it's an all encompassing in terms of the environment that you set up the routine that you set up, it's all part of, you know, like a whole, a whole ritual of sleep and it needs to be viewed in a positive way that it's going to lend itself to good outcomes, not, and I really like how you said, not to say you have to go to sleep, but that you get to go to sleep. I think it's just reframing all of that is really important. Mm -hmm. People, well, people treat sleep, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Marlon, people yeah. treat sleep like it's a chore with mm -hmm. the kid. You know, you, you're like, yeah. you're like you, put, you have to take the garbage out, you got to put the kid to sleep. It's like a yeah. chore. Yeah. Because only break a parent gets to not be a parent yeah. is when the kid is sleeping. Mm -hmm. And when you tell children that, they, don't, they can't imagine their parents not being parents because whenever they are around their parents, they're in parent mode. Mm -hmm. but, but we're different people when we're not around our kids to some degree, right? We behave and act a little bit differently. And mm -hmm. the only break a parent gets is when they get this kid to sleep. And you have situations where you may have a mother that sleeps 
biologically more hours of sleep than the child does. And that may be yeah. an issue there. And I, and I keep saying mothers, but it could be dads too. There's all kinds of families, all kinds of combinations. I'm just using yeah. the term mother as a general uh, caretaker term. I'm uh, sorry I interrupted you, Marla. You want to say something? No, no. I think it's it's fascinating and interesting. And I think what happens in a lot of cases is, is if it's you know historically gone badly, then it's very hard for the parents to feel calm enough to mm-hmm. make this safe and comfortable routine. Because how can you not be stressed if the last hundred days have been a battle and something horrible and you can feel that tension mounting and it's a fight to get your kid to lay down or whatever. So it's a lot of work for the parents to reframe it for themselves first before they can do that for the children. I think that's... That's yeah. very true. And I've seen this many, many times now. Things like restless legs you talked about earlier or, or just a child that needs a little, little less sleep than average mm-hmm. um, where the sleeping schedule has been imposed by the parents based on what the parents want for themselves. Mm -hmm. And now the kid has a situation where they're in bed and they're trying to be good because they've been told to be a good child. They've been offered a reward or something, but biologically they can't sleep yet. They're not Mm -hmm. at the right time to sleep. And now they feel pressure Mm -hmm. on themselves to sleep and they're not good at it. They have a sibling who's better at it. They feel bad about themselves. People with sleep problems often blame themselves. And you can see the seed planted for sleep problems and adults that I take care of that would begin in childhood because they were never considered good sleepers, something they weren't good at. There was something they were bad at their entire lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or they're told, well, you, you got that from your dad's side. They, they, they've been cursed. It's you're from your uncle's side, right? Now, you know, uh, and they're like, okay, what can I do? And a phrase that I sometimes use with people is that your tendencies are not your destiny. Right? And so, so just because you have a sense, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. But we really, really want the parents to sleep better first. That's what you want to do. Sometimes when your kid is crying and upset that they can't sleep, all the parent can do is pretend they're sleeping themselves. And the kid is like, okay, well, they're asleep. I might as well sleep too. Well, we know there's nothing else to do here. Mm-hmm. But, but eventually that'll happen. Um, an analogy that I've used many times, um, you may have come across this, if I may, is you go on any plane, you go on any airplane. Um, when you get on a plane, right? And especially in the old days before there was um, traveling was, was not as crowded. If you got on a plane and there's an, and when you sit down and there's an empty seat next to you, what are you thinking? I hope that seat stays empty, right? Best mm-hmm. case scenario, the seat remains empty. You feel like you've got a first class ticket if the seat next to you is empty. You got all the space of first class at, at a coach price, let's say. So if the seat next to you is empty, all you want is for that seat to remain empty. As the plane is boarding, right? Best case scenario, empty seat. What's worst case scenario? Crying baby. Nobody wants to sleep next to a, a crying, nobody wants to sit next to a crying baby on a plane. So just imagine, again, you're the mom, it could be the dad, but let's say you're the mom, walking down the aisle, you missed the pre-boarding, so now you're stressed. Yeah. Carrying the aisle, you have this baby, and all you're thinking of, I, I hope whoever I sit next to is good with kids, is not sick themselves. You got the diaper bag, you put the stroller up, it's stressful. things, yeah. Right, right, you're stressful. <laughs> you're coming down the aisle, and as you come down the aisle, Everybody with an empty seat next to them like, sees you coming. Like they look away. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they won't make eye contact with yeah. you. They hope to, they look away, hoping that, think that magically the seat assignment is going to change. And as a person gets further from them on the aisle, the number of empty seats dwindles, so the tension builds in the plane. Mm-hmm. And what you'll see what will happen is at some point, that baby will start to cry. When the baby starts to cry, it echoes in the, in the, in the cabin, and all eyes will dart on the mother. Mm. Right? What are you gonna do about it? The baby starts. The mother starts shaking the, the the baby like it's a maraca, right? She starts shaking that baby, and what happens? The kid starts crying. You watch this play out. Usually, a complete stranger offers to help the baby. For example, mm. the flight attendant. And when the flight attendant holds the baby, the baby stops crying. And the yeah. question is always the same: What does a stranger console a baby faster than its own mother? Because the mother is stressed and then it's feeding on the baby. Yeah. So if you have a child who is healthy otherwise and is now crying and upset, you got to calm yourself down first. You're shouting, shushing the baby, feeling the pressure because you got to get this kid to sleep because the other parent has to go to work in the morning. Mm-hmm. Is That pressure is not going to help anybody sleep better. Mm-hmm. So you really just got to take a step down and be very, it's hard to do, but you can practice yeah. this. Calm yourself down. Know that you're, you're lucky to have a healthy, beautiful, beautiful child. The kid will sleep eventually. And again, that gets to this whole issue of this, the frame of mind that people have yeah. around sleeping. You can't be sleeping as something you're dreading or 
a chore. I'm, I'm sorry to go off on that, but I thought it might be helpful. No, that's, that's great. Good. And it also describes my flying experience. Yeah. <laughs> we... Marla being a mom of a, of a toddler too. Yeah, she can relate, I'm sure. <laughs> so Marla, oh, yeah. that's, that's super quick. I've told that story many, many times. And one time I told it at a, at a community event and one of my neighbors was in the audience. I did not know my neighbor was there. She was a mother of a young child. And she said she was on a, a flight uh, to Oklahoma and the kid kept crying the whole time and took off. The baby kept crying and the pilot came out of the cabin it was a female pilot, and she says, where's that baby? Oh, no. And the pilot held the baby. The baby stopped crying. People on the plane started clapping. Wake the baby Mother. up. <laughs> well, no, the, the, the babies will fall asleep to noise, actually. will fall asleep yeah. to noise. But the people on the plane start clapping. The mother gets really embarrassed, and the pilot hands the baby back to the mother, and the mother starts, the baby starts crying again. Oh. So, oh. so, so you see how this plays out. You yeah. said it was a horrible oh, yeah. flight. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, Hina, why don't you go next, I think. Sure, yeah. Um, so is there any truth to this notion that many individuals with developmental disabilities may not, and I think you had mentioned this briefly earlier, that may not need a full eight hours of sleep or that they can actually make do throughout their day with a shorter amount? Sure. Or any one of us will tell you, when you ask about your sleep amount, sleep needs or sleep desires will give you two numbers. Mm -hmm. You're your own mind. If I say how many hours sleep you, you, you need, you may say things like, I like to get nine, but I get by with six. I need, I, I know I need, I like eight, but I can, if, I, if I get at least five and a half, I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And human sleep is probably seasonal to some degree. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got friends in, 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 in further north. Yep. Uh, in Alaska, for example, they'll tell you that they sleep more in the winter, less in the summer. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense if, if our human sleep cycle is dependent to some degree on light, the seasonality mm -hmm. of sleep is kind of built into it. So you have an ideal amount of sleep and you have um, an amount of sleep to get by. Yeah. And what happens is some people just get a habit of just getting by as little sleep as possible. So this part of that range is in there also. Mm -hmm. uh, with insomnia, we don't know, they usually come and says, I want eight hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, how many hours do you sleep? I sleep six, I sleep five and a half. Mm -hmm. We may get them to sleep an extra half hour, an extra 45 minutes of sleep, but it's a predictable time. We don't hit, they don't get eight. But now they no longer have that tension about sleeping. It becomes less of a concern to them. Yeah. They'll be there. That's why sometimes you hear the phrase, which is not a fair phrase, that sleep begets sleep. That the more you sleep, the more comfortable you are with sleeping, the more you do. I don't, mm -hmm. That's not a perfect term, but I think that kind of implies that to some degree. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there are going to be some kids that are going to need less sleep than others. The 2017 Nobel Prize uh, in, in medicine was for these things called the clock genes, the circadian system. And the, the our sleep mechanism, the timing mechanism is actually been worked out. It's located right behind our eyes. And those genes are similar to the same genes in flies. It's a very well-preserved system because mm -hmm. animals must predict sun up and sun down in order to survive. The world is very different daylight than nighttime. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a system that adapts to the change of seasons. We just had our summer solstice, mm -hmm. right? So we have long days. We should be behaving differently than we should on the winter solstice. It's yeah. a biologically different environment. So our brain must adapt to this. So you need a system in your head to adapt to this change of seasons. And I think that plays a role in it. That's why we talk so much about light mm -hmm. in the kids. So yeah, some of the kids may need less sleep, but you also may have a situation where you have one parent who needs less sleep than the other parent. And the child may take after the parent who, who sleeps a little bit less than average, but the main caretaker is the parent that needs more sleep. There's going to be a conflict there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. And I, I think, I mean, I, I, had a consultation with a parent um, a while ago where they were saying that their little kiddo with Down syndrome would have no problem falling asleep, would wake up in the middle of the night, and then, like you said, from a learned behavior perspective, dad would come, help him go back to sleep, would stay with him in the bed. And then th the mom was, at the end of the day, she was shocked that despite that disturbance in sleep, he could still function throughout the day. I mean, he was only five years old. He's only five. But so that's kind of what got me thinking, like, do, did that five-year-old really need a full eight hours of sleep? Or, you know, like, there's so many factors involved in trying to figure out how was he able to manage throughout the whole day when he had, like, this nighttime awakening for two hours and then went back to sleep and then got up and was ready to go. Well, he can get by. But I bet that child, if they got more sleep, they could do better yet. Yeah. There was a study done on healthy uh, adults, and they just had them take a nap. And these are adults who were getting all the sleep they needed, mm -hmm. but still managed when given an opportunity to take a nap. 
And they found that I think there was a, a jump of 23% or over 20% improvement in their, in their ability to remember a, a list of words. Mm -hmm. So there's a range of functionality. We're not fragile creatures. You can hold your breath on the water. Something as important as sleeping, you must be able to do without temporarily. We can skip a night of sleep. That five-year-old can like get by and do okay with that sleep, but they might do better yet. And what you're going to see with mild sleep deprivation is being a little bit moody, a little bit inattentive. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yeah, so a, time, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so a little bit, oh yeah, so a little inattentive. You give them a stimulant, of course yeah. they're going to behave better. Of and you course. go, oh, they have ADD. Well, yeah, maybe, but maybe they just need a little bit more sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That five-year-old that you're describing, the parent said he sleeps okay, but wakes up, he's the father there with him. That kid probably needs the father or one parent with him to fall asleep also at the beginning of the night. Yes, mm -hmm. 100%. You're right. Yeah. So, you're right. so that's what's really happening there. They're mm -hmm. masking. See, the parents don't mind help them fall asleep by doing that. Yeah. But it's later in the night that it becomes exactly an issue. that it comes back to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I talked, one of the things you can say to a child, and a child with Downs will understand this. Uh, but you can see the look in their eyes when you frame this to the child. Just talk with them about this. He goes, you know, when you come to our room at night, mm -hmm. mommy, daddy, you know, we love you, but it bothers us. Why? Well, it's very simple. The store doesn't sell any three people beds. It only sells two people beds, right? <laughs> you, 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 just, you don't fit, yeah, right? Just use You're logic, right? Right, yeah. Right, yeah. It, yeah. You know, it, if one child, if the parents are parallel to each other and the child makes the letter H with his body, whoever gets the feet is not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can explain to say, you know, yeah. it's, you still, uh, which we love you, but you're interrupting our sleep. Yeah. And then you tell the child, you know, that mommy and daddy sometimes wake up at night too. You know, when we wake up at night, do we mm -hmm. go in into your room and tell mm -hmm. you that we're awake? No, why not? Because it's rude. And yeah. kids learn about being polite. Mm -hmm. The fact that you woke up is one thing. The fact that you came into our room to let us know that you woke up is rude. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't need to do that. You can tell me in the morning that you woke up. I, I, I'll, I'll be here. I'll talk. I love to talk to you. I want to know about how your night went. Mm -hmm. Just tell me in the morning. You don't have to tell me in the middle of the night that you that you were awake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Waking up in the night should not be viewed as a problem to be fixed at that moment. Yeah. Sleep will come later. You can tell me about it later on. Mm -hmm. Stay in your room. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. And you, you. if you drive that home that point over and over again, very just matter of fact, mom and dad wake up at night. And we don't go tell you, right? It's, mm -hmm. You know, do you yeah, want me exactly. to wake you up to tell you that I woke up? You know, yeah. do it that way. Just, just very yeah. matter of fact that, that we're not rejecting you. It's just, you don't, the, the, the bed doesn't fit that way. You're growing. And they know that your shoes have changed, right? You know, you don't fit, your old shoes don't fit you anymore. There's no space in the bed for you. Yeah. Nobody put their kids in separate caves 30,000 years ago, right? Put them in a separate room is a cultural phenomenon, which is fine. You can afford a room that's wonderful. But, don't expect a child, but child has to learn to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not innate to them to sleep separate from a parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions? This is the other thing that we see a lot is, you know, the little kid, sometimes not so little, will wake up and three in the morning yeah. and start playing by themselves, very content, but mm -hmm. they might play, they might color, they might help themselves to whatever. At, until it wakes the parents up because they're playing trucks or they're playing things, making a yeah. ruckus. And they either, two things will happen. Either they're up for the day from 3 a.m. onward, it's a bad situation, or they then maybe f might fall back asleep an hour to two hours later, but then they don't want to get up when, well, you know, morning, school yeah. comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, so they're not getting mom and dad up per se, but they're, they're up. They're, they're being disruptive, mm -hmm. right? Or unsafe, sometimes nighttime wandering, you know, like mm -hmm. let's go on a walk. Let's take that dog out right now. Yeah, let's go right. grab a snack in the kitchen. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. First off, we never want to lock kids in the, in the bedrooms because it could be a fire. It could be a hazard. You don't want to tie anybody down. You don't want to lock them in. Um, so that's not something you want to do. That's not safe. It's better for you as a parent to close your door than to lock your kid in their room, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a safe thing to do. The child that's waking up that way, I, would, I think about the word breakfast, right? When you wake up in the morning, you want to have breakfast. Did your, did your stomach magically become empty when you woke up? No, it's been empty for hours. You could have eaten at any point, right? And in fact, it's kind of a fun thing to do sometimes if you've been out is to have an early breakfast before you get home because mm -hmm. your stomach has been empty. Um, but you know that food is going to come in the morning. So there's no need to sleep now. I'm going to make sleep a priority because I'm going to get my food later. 
and I can go without food enough hours without going to hypoglycemic shock. The child that's waking up, the probably has no motivation to make get get up at a certain time on their own. Mm -hmm. Parents may want the kid to be in their day program or, or go to the school, but the kid may have no incentive to do that. There's no sense of like, if I wake up now and play, I won't, I'm going to be late for what I have to do exactly. next, later. Yeah. They yeah. don't have, so you got to drill home that point that, so we always, no matter what we do, you can force people to wake up. You can't force people to fall asleep, mm -hmm. right? If, if um, so I know this is an audio podcast, but to listen to me, I know we're on Zoom, right? We're seeing each other. Yeah. So, so I'm seeing you, uh, Hannah. Uh, let's make believe that I'm watching you breathe and you're breathing 12 breaths a minute. Mm -hmm. I say, please take 12 breaths in a minute. I'll time you. You'll screw it up, right? <laughs> if you leave it alone, you'll just breathe rhythmically at 12 breaths a minute. Yeah. But if I tell you to do it, you're going to screw it up. Yeah. Sleep is the same way. Telling somebody to sleep is, is, is very hard. It's easier to force somebody to wake up. It's easier to force somebody to wake up than for somebody to fall asleep. I can wake you up no matter how sleepy you are. If I yell fire, if I, if I, if I, if I do something to you, you'll wake up because sleep is rapidly reversible by definition. So we must rapidly wake up when we need to, but we don't rapidly fall asleep and crash. We drift into sleep. Mm -hmm. So that child that you're describing, first of all, decide what is that you want to change, right? Is it that they're waking up and playing and making noise that's bothering the parents? Or is it waking up and not going back to sleep and not making it to, to there? So I try to be very focused on what is the actual problem itself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because waking up is normal. Mm -hmm. Wanting to play is normal. It's a question of what are the routine and, and, the, and the rhythm that we want to impose on the child. And it may be a rhythm that, that we're imposing on them that they have no motivation to follow. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to try to force somebody to do things, the way we force it is through their wake up time. So yeah, you want to be up? Go ahead, kid. But you got to get up at the same time, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And if you lock in the wake up time, parents say, oh, but it's a be horrible day. It'll be a very horrible day. Yeah, it'll be a horrible day for one, two, three days, four days. It won't go past a week or two of doing this if you keep locking in the wake up time. Okay. Because yeah. the sleep will consolidate. And one of the uh, concepts to get squeezed out middle of the night awakenings, uh, prolonged awakenings middle of the night is called sleep restriction. Sleep deprivation is different. That's a form of torture. Sleep restriction is saying, hey, we know that you typically do well on seven and a half hours sleep or nine hours of sleep. You, you're a nine hour sleeper, you get nine hours to sleep. And we lock in the wake up time, the bedtime's there. If you keep that bedtime, if you keep that wake up time locked in, they will eventually fall asleep. Mm -hmm. They always will lock in that wake up time. As long as they feel safe, comfortable and loved. If they feel stressed out, if there's something they're not good at, they're in pain, of course, it's a different scenario. But if the child is feeling in a state of serenity, that's going to happen. An easy example that, that uh, is a real experiment that anybody can do, um, and I'll, I'll describe this very briefly to you if I can. If you take a wild rat, a rodent, genetically set up to be nocturnal, always active at night, all this family is, is nocturnal. If you take that wild rat and simply do an experiment where you put it in a cage and only give it food and the lights are on, and and at night, you take away the food. What's going to happen? Initially, the rat is going to go hungry because genetically, it's a nocturnal animal and it's scared to eat in the daytime because it could be attacked by hawks. So the rat will go hungry. But eventually, the need for food will drive that rat to become active in the daytime. So you can make, you can make a genetic nocturnal animal behave like a diurnal animal, so the timing of its meals. Mm -hmm. So if the things that that child wants to get to, the toys or the snack are only available at certain times, they'll sleep. Now you may have a child whose parents are putting the kid to bed too early and the kid is already sleep satiated and they got, and they're awake because there's time for yeah. them to be awake. So, you, mm -hmm. so what you really want to do is figure out what is the total sleep you want the child to have, lock in a wake up time, go backwards. And that's the bedtime. So the bedtime may be much later mm -hmm. than you used to, but you lock in that wake up time and mm -hmm. that over f a few weeks will, will then get into a proper cycle. Assuming the sleep is of normal quality. Yeah. Um, before we take a break, I just wanted to ask you one more question. I'll hand it back over to Marla. Do sleep issues get worse during certain periods of, of our lifespan? Like I'm, I'm having some conversations with parents where their kids are kind of at that level of puberty and she's, and this kiddo has a dual diagnosis. So she's definitely, mom is noticing hormonal changes and she's trying to figure out a pattern. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, you know, some parents have said, oh, they used to be really bad sleepers, but now 
they've kind of, it's just been a phase. So is, is there any truth to how sleep patterns um, change over the course of a lifetime? Sure. Uh, a misconception is to think that sleep problems will go away on their own. Mm-hmm. And they don't, but because it's a learned behavior, a child can learn on their own how to sleep better. They can figure it out on their own and it'll be better. But there's a couple of things happen. With the onset of puberty, you get two things occur in kids. One, a biological tendency to be stay up more late at night. Mm-hmm. There's a shifting of our time points to stay up later. So you may have a child who now is refusing bedtime or having trouble falling asleep. If you keep that same bedtime as they go into puberty, they may now show up as having sleep onset insomnia because they're dwelling more to be a night person. Mm-hmm. Plus also, you know, a kid that age wants some privacy sometimes and they want to stay up past their parents. So they may have uh, behaviors, but it's not just a behavioral thing. Biologically, biologically, we shift our sleep in puberty. And other animals seem to do this, where they shift their sleep into the night. And this is, plays a role in the movement to delay school start times, which is a separate conversation, but you, it's mm-hmm. coming up. And along with that tendency to shift into a later point of night, if you think about a tribe of people, humans past the age of 50 to have a harder time staying up late at night. They start to go to bed earlier. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if the listeners are, are in their 50s and 60s, some of them, you'll say, oh, yeah, I could stay up l- later when I was younger. Now I tend to go to bed earlier. Mm-hmm. But it, again, it makes sense for, the, if, for a tribe, for somebody to be awake at different times. Mm-hmm. So we have this surge of, of energy at night. All humans get a surge of energy at night. Uh, sleep is not about being tired. We're actually more alert at night than we are at any other point because well, in the evening, we, we could be attacked by our predators. So we get the surge of energy and that shifting of that surge will be later with teenagers. Now, this is in general. There's going to be, of course, uh, uh, variations within this because there are genetic variations to this. So that's the circadian part of adolescence. That's a shifting to sleeping, staying up later at night. And it'll come across as insomnia because the kid is keeping the same bedtime. The other point is that, especially with the boys, but it can happen with the girls too, with the uh, onset of puberty, they get a deeper voice, thicker neck, and sleep apnea will kick in. So you have kids with mild sleep apnea, uh, that all of a sudden is getting worse because they develop pu- they're going to puberty and now they have more upper body issues. They get thicker necks with the mm-hmm. uh, testosterone your tongue gets thicker. You think it's get bigger. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's maybe happening. Yeah. On the flip side, you may have a kid with mild sleep apnea, five or six years old, and they have trouble sleeping. They, 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 the sleep is not restorative for them. So they, so they wake up tired. Parents think they need more sleep because the issue they're thinking is the hours of sleep. But it's not the hours, it's the quality because they have sleep apnea problems. Mm-hmm. But they try to correct a quality issue with called quantity correction. And that can help a little bit if it's mild, but it won't yeah. work if it's severe. Mm-hmm. So what's going to occur is um, if they decide not to take out the kids' tonsils, which is a whole separate conversation in, in this, in this we'll special group of, group of people, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, the tonsils will shrivel up on their own. Um, and behavioral issues tend to also improve because kids learn. So you tend to hit a sweet spot with kids around the age of nine or 10 where sleep problems seem to get better mm-hmm. because the tonsils are shriveled up. Now they're more used to what's going on. They haven't had the pubertal shift that I described earlier. So you have the sweet spot around nine or 10 and then they'll come back later sometimes. Yeah. I think that's the fluctuation that you tend to see. Yeah. And that's why I mentioned people say, oh, if you just do careful, you know, a watchful observation or, or a conservative treatment of their sleep apnea, it's going to go away. That's because they're looking at maybe nine and 10 year olds. But if you mm-hmm. check them out with the 15 or 16, you'll see that it's come back with it with a vengeance, I think. Yeah. A lot of these, a lot of people. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Yeah. Nice. Yes. We'll be back for more in depth discussion of sleep quantity and quality with Dr. Rafael Paleo. We will be discussing treatment options from testing to routines and supplements. Don't miss it next week on the Lowdown Podcast. Next week on the Lowdown. A Down Syndrome Podcast. People with sleep apnea tend to be very restless sleepers. People say things to me like all the time, well, I can't use CPAP because uh, I can't sleep on my back. Yeah. The reason you can't sleep on your back is because you have sleep apnea and the tongue slides backwards. Yeah. But if I get you in the right pressure, in the right position, the tongue will move forward, um, then there won't be an issue. Mm-hmm. No. Have you okay. had- so so that so so that'll that, that'll correct itself okay. once you get into the right position. And on CPAP, people will sleep better on their back. Having said that, new CPAP masks have been designed to let them sleep on their side. The Lowdown, the Down Syndrome podcast, is a production of Down Syndrome Research Foundation. Learn more at dsof.org and join the conversation at DSOF Canada on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The Lowdown is hosted by Marla Fodan and Hannah Mahmood. 
and is produced by Glenn Hughes. The lowdown theme music in George's due was written and recorded by Rick Scott.